Good to go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining Tech Academy's Friday Tech Talks. Today, we have two special guests, Brandon Snyder and Dylan Pyra. And they're going to give us some advice on how to be a successful software developer after graduation. So thank you for being here and take it away. Yeah, so we'll just give kind of quick introductions and then we have a slide deck to kind of talk through about some strategies and then can go through questions afterwards um, or during as they pop up. Um, so my name is Brandon Snyder. Um, I've been developing kind of in the dev space for about four and a half years now. Um, I was with a startup before I was with InTime Tech. Um, that's our current company. We're based out of Meridian, Idaho, and we'll give kind of more of a rundown of them here in a second. But um, yeah, my kind of specialty is more in C Sharp. That's what I've mostly been programming in, kind of back end web development. So that's kind of my experience. Uh, Dallin, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Dallin Pyra. I've been working at InTime Tech since about May of 2021. And before that, I went to a boot camp here in Boise, Idaho called CodeWorks. Um, we learned C Sharp, JavaScript, Node.js, and Vue over there. Um, before that, I didn't have any software development experience. I was going to school for architecture and then decided that I wanted to make a career change and um, got into software development and just never looked back. So it's been, it's been a good decision. Yeah, so we are um, both at Intime Tech, as we mentioned. Um, we're based out of Meridian, Idaho, just outside of Boise, um, for those of you who have heard of that. Um, so yeah, like we said, today's, what we're going to talk about is just what, what you need to know to be successful as a software engineer after graduation. Um, we'll have the slide deck available as well, I, I believe, share it to where you guys can have access to it. And obviously this isn't gonna be a catch-all be all for, for everything, but hopefully it kind of gives you at least an intro into some of the ideas that can help you as you begin your software um, journey. So InTime Tech is our company, just to give you a, a quick intro of what we do. Um, we help companies with all sorts of software needs. Um, we have both an onshore and offshore presence. Um, our main presence is actually in India. Um, we started over there and then um, the kind of co-founders were based out of uh, HP here in Mer Meridian. Um, and so kind of what we focus on is just this idea of it's creating abundance is kind of our company motto um, and just making sure that every step, every place that we step into, we're trying to create what we can from there, not just think about um, what we have, but push it above that and how can we prosper and really help each other to grow into who we need to be um, using software to do that. Um, so these are kind of the areas, different areas that we can hit throughout. So we don't actually develop our own products. We'll actually go into different companies, um, into different areas. Um, so we have, you know, all these different different styles um, of programming. Me and Dallin, we're in kind of that web development area, um, but we do get into kind of testing, a lot of testing, um, data science, and, and all sorts of stuff. So um, just kind of every area that is in that software space, um, we, we dabble in at least, but probably our main um, chunk of that pie is, is the web, develop, web and mobile development. So, yeah, so when it comes to being a successful software engineer, um, we kind of have this idea that rubber, rubber ducking, which is either you have a rubber duck on your desk or you have other software engineers around you. And when you run into issues, a big part is reaching out and asking questions and doing your due, due diligence to go and find the right answers. But a lot of the times you just need someone to talk to and the answers will come to you um, as you're talking the issue out. So here at InTime Tech, um, we may not have rubber ducks, but we use each other as resources to just kind of talk some of the issues that we're experiencing, um, some problems that may just be getting jumbled up in our heads. We go seek out other engineers and a lot of times um, they don't even need to give us any advice, we just end up 
figuring out what the issue was um, before they even give us um, in, any information. So I think that's a really important part is try not to um, just keep it all to yourself, just be an open book and uh, kind of explain what you're going through. Be, have that rubber duck available. I've also seen several people actually have rubber ducks on their desk too, so it is an option. Um, but yeah, so just kind of talking about the software life cycle and, and what it looks like to actually develop code, um, kind of we'll try to hit at least dive into each part of that. Um, and the first part of that is obviously writing the code out um, and dealing with the defects that may come up through that. Um, and this graph just kind of helps show where it's important to take the time to handle those defects, handle those issues. Um, you know, in, in a school environment, you don't have that production step where you actually push that out um, into a production environment. Um, but as you get into kind of professional software development, that's obviously going to be an aspect of that. Um, and the important thing to remember with that is obviously you just don't want to have bugs when that happens. Um, and so just remembering to when you have the time to develop, when you have that step of coding, um, that that's where you're really working through every step that you can um, and making sure that you're making the code as high quality as possible so that when you get to that um, production step, uh, there's a high confidence level that there are not those defects there um, because that cost to fix those is tremendous in a production environment. Um, you might be dealing with um, outage for your product, which obviously will cost your, um, cost a lot of things. You're also dealing with having a bunch of people jumping into that, which is taking them away from other work to where when it's the work in front of you, what you're working on, um, that's what's expected. That's what you should be aiming for is to get those defects out in that time um, and do everything possible to make sure that those don't bleed into a production environment. And, and when it comes to code quality, um, we go through code reviews here at Intime Tech with all of our projects, but uh, this is just a good example of what you should be saying and what you shouldn't be saying when you're reviewing someone's code. Um, on the left-hand side is, is good code. You only have two WTFs per minute. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you've got about six and a, a lot of uh, curse words that you know you may you may run into but um it, it's just a metaphor when in reality it's when you're going through good code a lot of the times you may still run into things that you find wrong with it but when you run into bad code it's almost everywhere where you're wondering what this person was doing so just making sure that when you're in that development phase um, making sure that quality is first and foremost, will get you a long way. So with that, um, here's some more sayings you don't want to be saying when uh, reviewing code is, this is a mess. Uh, this looks like spaghetti code. Uh, why is this so brittle? Or this whole project is a nightmare. And then some things you actually want to be saying is instead you're like this uh, this code was written clean it was it was elegant it's expressive it reads like text um, you only need to make changes in one place and it's easy to maintain if you find yourself uh, saying those things instead of the previous then most likely uh, code review is looking good and the person did a great job This is kind of what we're going to walk through um, for kind of what what we're aiming for when we talk about clean code. What does it actually look like? Um, and what are things that you have to keep in mind? Um, but I, I just say the thing that has helped me most when coding is I heard somebody kind of make an analogy for writing an essay um, and that when 
you know, in school, what you're supposed to do, right, is do that rough draft, kind of work on that, have a lot of iterations on that before you even go to have somebody else review it before you turn it in um, and write it in a way that makes sense and flows and is easy to follow. And to me, that, that still applies to coding, even though obviously we're not writing sentences out, we're not writing paragraphs, um, but it still applies with, with your functions and with your classes that you want things to connect in in a way that makes sense so that when you're reading through code, even if you're hopping around to different files, that flow still makes sense um, and you're not left with getting completely lost or not knowing what is happening. Um, there's always gonna be some element of that, right? If you're in a new code base to, to understand that. Um, but the tighter that can be and the more elegant that can be, um, the closer that you're gonna be to that final draft, which is what you're kind of aiming for if you're going to actually release something um, to production is it needs to be really cleaned up um, and and made in a way that that just is going to make sense. So um, we'll kind of talk through each of these bullet points though as we go out um, and kind of dive into these. So the first the first place that we start with that um, is for for our company kind of what we rely on um, is this for this clean code our these um, textbooks. So these are all by Robert C. Martin or Dr. Bob. Um, and this clean coding principle is is kind of pretty well known. Um, it's a pretty popular book. And just talking about not only creating code that works um, and that does what it's supposed to, but is clean enough in a way that it makes sense, um, doesn't have a lot of bloat, and is easy mean easily maintainable. Um, so I'd, I'd, that'd be my highest recommendation um, for reading, for sure. Um, and then he has a couple other ones as well as you work your way up, um, kind of with the architecture level where not only are you building code that is clean um, and makes sense, but the actual system that you're building that, that whole, across the whole product, what does that look like and how can that be as clean as possible? Um, and then just a couple other shout outs of some books um, that, that we use here um, and recommend here. Uh, again, we'll, we'll share this so, so you have reference for it. Um, but just kind of trying to get at the idea that th there's a lot of knowledge out there. Um, a lot of people have obviously been through this. Uh, and so there's a lot of wisdom to kind of gain from that. So as much as possible, I'd recommend getting out there and, and reading um, as much as you can. To, to really grow your knowledge as a developer and, and become the best developer that you can. Um, I will kind of specifically call out these ones as well. Um, I think a lot of the times if somebody says they're a developer, they're thinking of, well, I code and I am in my computer heads down just writing out that code. Um, but that's only a you know, small part of writing software, honestly. Um, a lot of it is dealing with the people on your team uh, making sure that you're communicating well with your team and communicating well with stakeholders of whatever product that you might be working on so that they, you know, are encouraged by what you're doing and, and still you're able to maintain your job and, and keep everybody happy. And so, um, you know, it, it doesn't just end at, at coding. It really is there's less people interaction than other jobs that I've had for sure. I've worked in service industries and things like that, but um, you can't just let that go to the wayside. That's still a huge part of being a developer. And I think with the books, a good um, way to think about it is a lot of times we may, we may go on the internet and find uh, answers to our problems, but what books, these books offer us are a way of thinking a way of thinking about these problems in which we can go about and solve them without having to look them up. And it's totally fine to look up your uh, problems on the internet, but um, it provides a framework to um, kind of combat the problems. And after going through clean code, um, it, it really just changed my mindset as to how I'm approaching the development phase. So that's just one piece of advice I'd give to everyone. But uh, moving on to the next is 
this quote by Edwards Deming, which is, we cannot rely on mass inspection to improve quality, though there are times when 100% inspection is necessary. As Harold S. Dodge said many years ago, you cannot inspect quality into a product. Quality is already there or it isn't by the time it's inspected. And this is a great quote because a lot of times, um, by the time your code gets to code review or you know, there's static code analysis checkers in our pipelines, uh, it's too late to have to develop quality because that should have been done before you pushed it up to Git. And by the time the code reviewer is there or you know, sometimes we have product owners or pretty much anyone, anyone's looking at that code, it's, it's got, the quality's got to be there before you push it up. So no matter how long you look at that piece of code, it's, it's not going to get any more, uh, it's, it's not going to get any better until you go and change it. So I, I would suggest just taking the time before you push up any of your code to, you know, look it over. Uh, and if you haven't done that, then you have a rough draft. And I would just say, try to get, try to get it to a final draft before you push it up. And, and, and that will make a big difference with the people you work with and how they perceive uh, your, your development work. Yeah, and I'd just say, you know, to add to that, your, your job isn't done when you've gotten your code to work. Um, it's, it's done when it's at a level of quality that it makes sense. Um, other people can follow, other, and it's also extensible. So if in the future you need to build off of that, it's easy to do so. Um, and kind of once all those aspects are considered, then, then it's done, right? Um, getting it to work is, is an important step, but just one step along that process. Another step along that um, process is testing. Um, it's a very important process that, again, I think that a lot of people, it's easy to put it to the wayside because what's really important is, in people's minds, and it is important, is to get it working. And if it's getting, if it's working, if I can pull it up, you pull up a test environment, go through a test, okay, yeah, it's, it's doing what I, what I want it to, okay, I'm good to go, ship it, right? Um, Without testing to rely on, that's going to create a lot of issues um, down the line. And something that I've seen in new developers, as well as just that lack of focus on testing, um, and the more that you can focus on that, the stronger your code's going to be, the more confidence that you're going to have in the future when developing, that your code's doing what it should. Um, and it just makes, just makes life so much easier when you have good testing set up. It can be difficult to do that, but once it's there, it's it's a wonderful world to be in. So, and the main idea of that um, that people kind of rely on is called test-driven development. So that's what TDD stands for. Um, and so that's this idea that all code is guilty until proven innocent. Um, strict TDD is is basically that you write your tests until they are breaking. And then you go and write your like service level code or whatever product code that you're working on. Um, so kind of what that would look like, um, again, true strict TDD would be that you would write a test first if you had some method that you were trying to create. You would write that test first for that method before you even write the method. You call that method. Obviously, that's going to break because it doesn't exist. Then you go and write that method. Then once that method is written, you go kind of back and start building out your test cases. As soon as it, you have a test case that fails, you go back over here to make sure that that test fails. So it's a, it's a lot of back and forth. Um, personally, and this is, I, we kind of lead a um, learning group. And what I say in there is, you know, that that, that sort of strict TDD is, is pretty tedious um, and kind of cumbersome. It's, it's good practice to do. Um, because it does get in your mind how important tests are. And if you don't do that, it's very, it's always easy to let tests fall to the wayside. This is true in any product, in any environment. Um, it's easy just to jump in there and get working code um, without having those tests built in. So this test-driven development really points you towards that. Um, but what I would say is having kind of a test-focused development is really what I would suggest of 
I think it's okay to like write out a test that you would want to have, even if it's more maybe than um, is necessary, and then spend a little bit more time in your product. Because there's there's times where you're having in a good rhythm, having good focus, and it doesn't really make sense to back, back bounce back and forth, and that's totally acceptable. Um, but the main point of this, and, and the point I don't want to be lost, is that tests are extremely important and need to be written um, for every piece of code that you write as much as possible. Um, because just without, with a good solid test, um, the power that that gives you is in the future, if you have a new feature that comes in, you add it. In your mind, it shouldn't change any of your code. Um, but there have been plenty of times in my life where I'm like, yeah, this won't change anything else. Just I'm going to make this one change over here to add this feature and we're all set. And then it breaks this thing over here that I didn't even think about. Um, but if you have those tests, a strong test suite with those tests built out, you now have the confidence to say, well, I know all these things work because they're all passing. Or if you make that change, you'll see that that fails before it gets out into that production environment. Um, so just as strong as I can convince you all to make tests as soon as possible um, and as often as possible and not consider it done again until you have that testing layer. And, and with that, um, I've had the opportunity to work in legacy code for the last year, and there's no unit tests in these projects. Um, and, and that come and that results in us finding these bugs and defects in production and pages aren't working or things that should be um, no longer work because of features that got pushed up. And what unit tests allow is for us to catch that before we even uh, push it up or maybe in the pipeline. It allows us to see what part of the code got changed. And, and with that, um, this chart kind of shows the de defect density, and it it will show how much time it takes to develop a feature versus how many defects um, that produces. And when you're more focused, when you're more test focused, sure, it may take a little bit longer, and um, you may not be able to get your features out as quick. But down the line, uh, as you can see, it really helps because those features no longer have defects and you don't have to go back and fix them and, and spend even more time trying to fix something that could have been resolved at the very beginning. Um, so that's a, that's a, there's pros and cons, but um, you've got to weigh those and a lot of times being test focused is uh, the right path to go down. I'd say too, as you're, um getting into a professional environment, a, lot, a big part of that is people asking, you know, how long is this going to take um, to do this ticket? Don't just budget the time to take to get it to work. Budget the time it takes to get it to work, the time it takes to add tests, the time it takes to um, go through your code and make it quality. And and that should be how long the task is, because that, that is the task, right? It's not just getting it to work. It's, it's all of those aspects. Um, so when you're giving estimates of time, make sure that you're considering that. And it'll take time to learn what that even is, how long that, that time period is. Um, kind of what I have fallen to is usually in my mind, I'm like, OK, yeah, that'll take one day. So I'll say, say that that takes two days, just kind of double it. Um, that doesn't mean the other day I'm not doing anything. It usually takes at least those two days. Um, but just making sure that you have that time baked in to build that out. Um, so if you want an example of test-driven development, this is a good kind of demo video of that. Um, we won't go through that here, um, but it is, it'll be available to you to just kind of actually see, OK, what does it look like? What does this process look like to do test-driven development? And kind of that bouncing from the test to the actual code itself. Um, so we'll have that available for you. Um, so, so we're kind of through the process, right, getting your code to getting your tests out. Now we can kind of talk about what does it look like and how do we build out um, quality code. 
Um, and these are kind of some, some checklists to kind of go through and consider as you're, as you're moving through your code. Um, some of these are like strategies to help you. Some of them are um, things to look at. A um, couple things that I'll just highlight here, um, class quality. If you want to make sure that your class kind of the the first step for me in a class is the point of a class is to have one responsibility. It's the single responsibility principle um, out of the solid principles, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so just making sure that your class is doing the thing that it should be doing and doing it in the most efficient way that it can, uh, and that things are broken up in ways that, that make sense. And again, as that flow and ties into the, the program as a whole. Um, the other one I know for me that I kind of found through through clean code that stuck out to me was self-documenting code. Um, I and different people have different opinions on this, and so I'm, I don't want to step on any toes. But um, kind of a it, there's been kind of a more recent push to get away from comments. I think at at one point there was there was a large push for comments and to to make sure every line of code is commented, every function is commented, every method, all of that. Um, but there are benefits to that. There are also drawbacks to that because while it's you will go in and refactor code, not a lot of people go back and update those comments because they just kind of see the green or whatever color it may be on your IDE and just kind of tune tune it out and just focus in on the code. That's that's been my experience. Um, and so as much as you can, making your code document itself. So having well-named variables, having functions that are well-named, um, making sure that you're having the flow in a way that makes sense. Um, if if there's a confusing, usually if there's a confusing line of something, rather than add in a, co a comment above it to kind of explain it, it, it makes a little bit more sense to make that into its function, um, as long as it makes sense within the environment, obviously. But make that into a function that kind of tells what it does, right? Um, and that's an acceptable practice as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not necessarily the authority in that. But um, just, just making sure that your documentation kind of takes care of itself in the way that you write code so that you don't have to have this beefy documentation that is going to be outdated in a few weeks, because that'll happen often. Um, so those are kind of things to focus on uh, as far as strategies to kind of help you get there. Uh, pair programming, I, I imagine you have experience with. Um, but if, if you don't, that's that's programming with somebody else live. Um, I've heard it called extreme programming as well. I don't know why it's extreme, but um, just kind of, it, it's always helpful to get somebody else with you, um, get another set of eyes on it, and work work as a team on it. I always really enjoy those times. Uh, there's often times that I've been super stuck on something and somebody else comes in um, for just a few moments it's like oh yeah duh, thank you for helping me through that and that kind of not only builds up your knowledge but also builds up relationships which is a, a nice part of the job so um the other thing that i wanted to call out is um, be right below that the pseudo code uh, that's a practice that i had when i was going through schooling a lot you know i was that was one of the steps i had to do is go through and pseudo code um, and i think that's extremely important I would also say that like, as you grow as developers, I still make sure that you do that. Doesn't necessarily mean that you need to write it out every time, again, as you get more experience. But in my head, I'm always kind of doing that pseudo code of, OK, here's where I want to get to. Here's where I'm starting. What What's the process going to look like? Um, and that, that helps a lot, kind of taking that breath before you actually start writing out code. Um, just saves time and can kind of get around some of the difficulties that you might run into later. And with that, we kind of have a class quality checklist, which classes are pretty important because they're everywhere in an application. And uh, we, we want to make sure that these classes are following kind of some, some clear defined standards. Um, not going to go through all of these, but uh, you kind of want to make sure that these classes are following the 
single responsibility rule, which is a big one. Um, if if you have classes that you know have uh, functions that should be in a separate class, like you have functions that get a user, and then you have functions that um, get a truck. Those don't have anything to do with each other, and ideally, those should be in two different classes. Uh, with that, uh, is that are these classes loosely coupled? Meaning, do these classes rely on each other in order to work? Are they able to be independent and work uh, without a whole bunch of other um, kind of boilerplate code? And I think a big one is, can you treat the class as a black box? I know in legacy code, we have files that are 8,000 lines long, and which is not something that that is is good at all. And um, these classes have other classes in them, and and they have um, sometimes they have the whole entire application's data layer in it. Um, and and looking at that, um, those should be kind of transferred out into their own classes because it makes it easier to read and understand, and the structure of it um, helps new developers like uh, me, who I a year ago getting into this project understand it a lot better because we can we can find where those classes are at um, so those are just the top ones that i wanted to go over but uh, just take a look at these questions and ask yourself when you're going through creating classes or even refactoring classes uh, do, do they follow these certain standards and if not what can you do to change it Just this idea that we've mentioned a couple times of, of baking in quality um, into your code before, as soon as possible, right? Like as you're going through the process, um, because as Dallin said earlier, right? It, when you get to the code review, it's it's already kind of too late for that. Um, the reason for that is you've now put that burden of quality on the person that's reviewing your code and you're taking time away from them. And usually that's like a senior engineer or, or kind of a higher level engineer that they their time is precious. And so if if you're putting the quality, burden of quality on them, um, that's gonna take time away from what they could be working on um, elsewhere. And so rather than kind of think, okay, yeah, at the end, that's when I'll put in the quality, right? Um, you wanna be thinking about that as you're going through the process. Um, and from the very beginning, each line of code that you write, usually usually what I'll do if I have to write a function, right, I'll write that out as much as I can and then read over it and refactor it right there on the spot. As we called back to earlier, right, it's a lot easier to have that quick um, process there and to find defects in that coding step than it is down the line in, in that, um, whether it's code review or in the production, obviously, um, it's going to be a lot harder to, to find that. Um, so really, you want to focus on quality as soon as possible and, and constantly so that when you get to that, that step of, OK, I have my code in a, in a place that I want somebody to take a look at, there's already a confidence level that it's as high of a quality as I know that I can get to. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. So for that quality, um, some things that can kind of help you are kind of for the semantic, I would say, quality. Um, so just things like, you know, where do you put your brackets? How do you order your import statements? Some of those like more baseline style um, requirements. A lot of that we use kind of style checkers for that. A lot of companies, I know that um, the company we work for, Truck Stop, has their own kind of style um, formatting rules that you can just basically import into your IDE, and then every time you hit the Save button, it'll automatically um, format it in a way that meets their coding standards. Um, so these are all kind of um, ones that have been used um, that we're familiar with. Obviously, there's there's more out there than than these, um, but just to kind of keep in your mind. Um, some of them, and, and it really helps when you're developing as well because it'll call it out, um, kind of show as error lines sometimes, um, depending on how you have things set up so that you know, 
you know, you don't have to have that step of, okay, I have my code where I want to be. And it's like, okay, well, yes, but you need to move this around, you know, kind of reorder all those things. Um, so those are just a huge benefit to rely on. Um, and then kind of these static analysis tools. Um, I know for our product or our project, the one that I'm mostly familiar with is Sonar Cube. Um, the nice thing about working is in tech is that you are working with technology and that's that's advancing um, and there's some cool things that can come out of that and uh, so for, for example on our project for sonar cube what we have set up for it um, so it'll go through and analyze kind of the basic things about um, about a class like if you have a private member that you're not um, referencing it'll throw a warning and let you know that you need to clean that up, um, either remove it or change it to public if it is being used somewhere else. Um, and the the main thing that I see the benefit for it is it'll actually go through and do some test coverage. So what that means is it will analyze your functions and analyze your unit tests. You can hook those up and say, OK, what part of this function or what part of this class is not called through these unit tests that you have set up. Um, so that'll actually give you kind of a percentage of test coverage. Uh, so every time that we push code up to our um, repo, it'll analyze that and tell you, okay, did you increase coverage or decrease coverage based off of the work that you did? So if you add a bunch of work without writing unit tests for them, that percentage will go down. Um, if you write a bunch of new uh, code and write unit tests for them, that uh, percentage will stay the same. Um, so basically, it'll go through and analyze, OK, in this if statement, um, this this is either true or false based on this test case. So that condition got satisfied. So that part of it's tested. Um, if you don't go through and have a test case that tests the other side of that if statement, then it'll say that that's not covered. Um, and it'll take that out of the percentage. So there's some really cool tools out there. That's just my experience with it i know that there's you know it, it can do probably a lot more than even what i have eyes into but that's been the biggest benefit for me to kind of help reach that full coverage of of your code and making sure that when you're writing code it's getting tested that there's this uh this meme which is one of my favorites um which is kind of it kind of goes over and and describes a man who's going through some code and he's figuring out that he's the one who wrote this spaghetti code. Um, and I, I relate to that a lot because though there's times where I'm sure you can ask any developer here, um, we're going through code review or we're going through uh, some some code in the in the project and we're wondering who who wrote it um, and, and why they wrote it that way. And with that, uh, in these IDEs, you can go and check, you know, who who wrote this code and how long ago. And I, I've definitely uh, gone and, and checked who who wrote the code, and it'll it'll say seven months ago you wrote this code and you implemented this. I'm like, well, I don't know what I was thinking, but um, but you know, it allows us to refactor and everything. But it's just a it's just a funny thing that we run into sometimes. What kind of helps with that is is this idea of source control. Um, hopefully, you guys are at least familiar-ish with the idea. Um, kind of the big ones being GitHub and GitLab um, and Bitbucket. Um, those are the ones that I'm most familiar with. There's there's others out there. Um, our project uses GitLab. Um, I've used GitHub in the past um, and personally use use GitHub. And then our company, I think. So our, our client uses GitLab, our company uses Bitbucket. Um, but anyways, the, just this idea of source control, you, you can't work on code as a team without this, I think. I mean, you could, but it, it would be so difficult. And again, kind of a technology that is available to us to help really make this as smooth as possible uh, and just makes it pretty easy as well uh, to be able to check out a branch, do your own working code, and kind of merge that in. I will say that you know, starting out being a successful developer, it's very important to be at least have basic knowledge in in these um, 
in the source control with Git, basically. Um, and so just knowing how to make a branch, knowing how to commit to that branch, um, push that up to the remote um, and pull that down as well. And just kind of handling those, just, just that level is gonna be super important uh, because that's gonna pretty much start from day one from my experience is you're gonna create a branch to work on stuff or pull stuff down. Um, so just make sure that you kind of have that that basic understanding. And there's a lot of good resources out there too if you're not sure about um, how to use source control. There's there's examples out there to, to kind of get used to. And I would always suggest just kind of doing it on your own, doing it personally and making a dummy branch with not really any code on it, but just kind of practicing um, some of those things before you get obviously on um, a any sort of production environment. I'd also say that from what I've seen, we've also sort, sort um, started to advance beyond just the source control aspect, so just the code um, control aspect of it, but also into kind of the the pipelines as well, so CI/CD. So um, I think I this saw earlier, and we'll go through the questions, but I think I saw pop up um, what we mean by pipeline. So when you create an app, you have your code, um, you have to get that out to the, the client who's ever using that. Um, and so the pipeline, what that does, it depends on the product, but a typical uh, flow would be in each environment. So in a QA environment, in a stage environment, and in a production environment, um, going through and testing your code, um, deploying it to the cloud usually um, is kind of where we're at now. Um, doesn't have to be in the cloud, but just just building building out the app to make sure that it runs, doing testing against it, and just kind of that that flow of the app of starting from code to test to building or building to test to then actually deploying to wherever people are gonna get access to that, whether that's on the web or through the app store. Um, kind of that whole process is that pipeline. Um, and for at least um, on the side that I'm at in, in Truck Stop, that's all handled in GitLab. So as soon as we push up a commit to um, the release branch for our code, it starts running through that pipeline. And so it'll automatically run through um, building out in, in QA, the app testing it in QA, and then if it passes that, moves on and, and walks through, um, which makes our jobs as developers really nice because we're just pushing up our code and it's automatically doing this work. And that's more and more what companies are trying to work towards if they're not there already from, from what I've seen. Um, but it also means that you need to be familiar with that and know how that works and um, kind of look into those they're called usually actions, like GitHub actions or um, build actions. So yeah, it's just, that's a good kind of, that would, to me, it depends on your product. So it's hard to suggest looking into things now, but just be aware of that in the future. Um, so what this looks like, if you haven't like ran into that before, um, kind of what source control actually looks like is you have a version of the file on the left and a version of the file on the right, and it shows changes that have been made. So if it's green, it means we're adding stuff on to what was there previously. If it's red, it means we're taking away um, what was there. Uh, I, For myself, I, when using Git, I would just do it in the command line uh, for the longest time until I realized that most IDEs have um, that kind of built in and, and a way to actually visualize it like this that makes it a lot more clean and understandable. Uh, there's also just full applications that only deal with source control. Um, I know source tree, I think is one that um, a lot of people use um, since I'm in C Sharp, Visual Studio again has that built in. And so I can make commits, add and remove things from um, changes on my branch just from my IDE. So that makes it really nice. Stemming from that, um, we a lot of times put the build settings in our IDEs. I know in, in some of the projects that I've worked on, there's a lot of warnings that pop up. And uh, if you think about it, 
you may you may just kind of look over those warnings and you know I'll, I'll just fix it later but it's it's like a car that um, kind of has this weird noise while you're driving down the freeway and eventually um, some dependency is going to depreciate or someone's going to change something and those warnings are going to turn into errors um, so just making sure that in your build settings you just change it from warnings or errors and we're going to go and fix those errors before they cause any issues down the line uh, and, and and a good static and uh, analyzer we there's one built into visual studio but uh one that i might recommend everyone check out is um, JetBrains products they have great static anal analyst tools built into their ides that just happen automatically and you can go throughout the file and it, and it will show you all the warnings and depending upon whether you configured those warnings as errors, it, it will show them as errors and just kind of make sure that your code is running as optimal as, as possible. So um, I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. I might speed up a little bit, but I do wanna make sure that I'm for sure hitting this topic um, of the Scrum process. This is something that shows up a lot in a lot of different companies and something that I've really enjoyed um, in the in the product that we work on is this sort of um, way of working through um, tickets and working through requirements. Um, so basically the idea is you're always gonna have a backlog of tasks that you need to work on um, no matter what. And so what the, the Scrum process or Agile, um, what they focus on is breaking that up into sprints. And so rather than looking at that full list of, of features that you need to work on, you take the time to kind of go through sprint planning and actually say, okay, what, what out of this do we wanna accomplish within the next two weeks? And so you kind of take that off the top um, of the pile and then work through that each individually. And you'll have daily meetings where you check in and say, okay, yeah, I'm working on this right now. It's um, it's in code review right now, or whatever, um, and kind of kind of work through that in segments. And then at the end of that sprint, if you have something to ship out, you can. If not, um, if with the tickets that you've worked through, you don't really have anything to to push out, you could just pick up more tickets on the next round and hopefully reach a point where you can actually ship something out. Um, and then you actually have time to review kind of baked in of how did the sprint go, what are positives that we had, what are negatives that we had. Um, and just this process is, I, I remember learning about it and being like, that's kind of weird. It seems like a lot of overhead to have to go through that. Why can't we just work through stuff? And then getting into an environment where we didn't have this process set up and just had a backlog, it's exhausting and it's demoralizing because you just have this huge list of things that yeah you take one thing off the top but by the time you took one thing off the top five things may have been added to the bottom so it just feels like you're drowning basically in work and that you'll never kind of complete that that end to where if you take kind of chunks off you feel that satisfaction of okay yeah we worked through what we needed to this time and that's what we were aiming to do so we met our goal we're on track with what we want sure things may have been added down here at the bottom but i don't have to think about that right now i just have to think about what's in front of me what i need to work on uh, and make sure i'm accomplishing that so um just kind of as a plug for agile and, and the scrum process i know it, it may not make sense right now but when you get into it um, for me, at least, I've really enjoyed being part of that process, and, and it just helps from being burnt out um, with the amount of work that you have to do. So just a couple other reading recommendations here. Um, again, we'll kind of just pop them up here. Um, some of them are repeats, too, but just so you kind of have them all in one place. Um, and, and wanted to call this one out specifically though just i know coding the interview side of things is really intimidating especially if you haven't been in it before um this is a solid resource to kind of fall back on it's one that's used a lot I also suggest just googling uh interview questions um but as a whole my interview experiences i've also only like interviewed at places i want to be but they've all been really positive just kind of be yourself represent the knowledge that you have the best that you can um, and again it, every environment i've been in it's never 
people aren't trying to get you. They're not trying to trip you up. They just want to know what you understand and know where your limits are. And if that means that you're not a good fit for the company, then there's another company out there for you. If it means that you are, then that's great. Uh, and things can kind of progress from there. So yeah, um, that is what we had. Um, I know there were some chatted answers, so we can try to hit those real quick. Go kind of back to the beginning. Um, so the static analysis checkers, that's kind of what we mentioned of just making sure that code is kind of formatted in a good way. Um, and that's what Don had called out as well with um, some of those. Um, the JetBrains one is, is a good one to kind of look at. In general, they have good products. Um, so the how might you test if the test itself is good? That is a great question and is very difficult to do. Um, that's why we have usually QA people dedicated to that sort of thing. Um, really, there's it's hard because there's not really much you can do besides just spending time with it and thinking through things. Because um, it's, it's hard to find those edge cases. And if you just write the code for like what you see in the moment, um, you're going to miss those. So what I would suggest is just getting it as, as many hands as possible, because people are going to look at it differently and come up with edge cases that you may not even think about. Um, and so that's that, to me, is a great way to kind of build out your test, is to just get it into as many hands as possible and, and see if it makes sense. But that is that's a constant battle, and that there's not necessarily a tried and true answer, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Let me see if we can just I'm kind of making sure we can hit all of them. So I was just doing a scan. And if other people have questions as well, they can either chat them or, or call them out. Uh, yeah, there's one question asking about the blue donut logo and the fox looking logos. Um, so the blue donut logo was Bitbucket. Um, and then the fox looking logo was GitLab. Um, and those are just two different source control systems. Yeah, and defect density number, I don't necessarily know how they calculated that, but just kind of the amount of defects um, that you run into. I, I don't know necessarily how that number was calculated, but and kind of some of the questions on the charts. I We kind of found those to kind of get those points across. I don't necessarily know the uh, methodology behind creating some of those. So, so there are good, a good amount of questions. If you're not able to get through them all, we can answer them afterwards. Okay. Um, but go ahead, Brandon, if you want to answer a few of them or if you can get through them, just let us know. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so I would say, um, for any of you who have questions and haven't chatted, let's kind of have time for that now. Um, and then I'll go through the chat questions kind of at the end of time. Yeah, if somebody has a verbal question, you can uh, go ahead and raise your hand and I will unmute your mic. Also looks like we just got another question in the chat. It says, is it too late to start reading clean code if you're about to start working? No, definitely not. Um, there are people who, yeah, have been developing for years, um, and still you're going to gain knowledge from from reading that. Um, so yeah, I definitely go for it. Um, it's always going to help. And that I would say, as you're a developer, there's always going to be more research out there for you to do, um, and and feel free to continue that. Personal developers development is extremely important. And a lot of places are accepting of that. And so just make sure that you're doing what you can to grow as a developer. Because yeah, that doesn't end once you get a job. Yeah, we do uh, highly recommend uh, Dr. Bob's or Uncle Bob's uh, books. He, uh, he's, got, he's an icon in the industry. And um, he's got a lot of YouTube videos as well with talks and um, events that he does. And they're really informative. Highly recommend them. Great. Um, we do have like one more minute. Uh, I don't know if you guys have a meeting to get to, so I just want to wrap it up in case you guys do. Uh, but if you guys do have a question, feel free to email me and I can definitely get to Brandon or Dylan uh, 
to answer those questions for you. And I can leave my email in the chat. Right, um, on email. Um, also, uh, we do have an in-person tech talk next week, and um, it's going to be at our Portland campus. If you're around this area, feel free to join us in person. We'll also be hosting it virtually, the same Google Meet room, and you can RSVP for the virtual one with the second link. Oh yeah, and I forgot the add symbol. My email. It's uh, kind of hard to type and talk and type. There we go. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so thank you all for joining. And then thank you guys for an awesome presentation. This is also going to be recorded. So you guys can always check back on our YouTube channel to see the recording and see the information on here. Uh, I can also share a link to our tech talk where you can watch this back. We'll be posting it later today. Um, but thank you again, you guys, for sharing your advice. And uh, we really appreciate the presentation. And thank you all for joining. And hope to see you guys next week. Yeah, really good presentation, guys. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, that's really good information for our students. We appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank right. you. Have have a good weekend, everyone. We'll see you next week. See you guys later.